welcome everyone and a special and warm welcome to our two exceptional speakers today, Professor Luis Fresco and Tukbase Dyson. We hope all of you and your families are healthy and well in these complicated times. In the first Verbier Summit, Size Matters, the growth of the 21st Century Art Museum, institutional behavior, so to say, was discussed widely. Our interest was not to say small is beautiful, but rather to look at how size in general can matter and how looking at size can be a tool to rethink attitudes and find possibilities for change, or at least invest in a process of unlearning from patterns, patterns and impulses of our political, societal, cultural institutions and how they are behaving in it how to deal with global connectivity, new planetary responsibilities, geopolitical and patriarchal histories of power, how to make space for difference, equity, non-dominant knowledge systems, interdisciplinary and collaborative approaches. Our two speakers come from different fields, but both are highly invested in the interdisciplinary and in questions of sustainability, our environment, shared geographies and planetary resources as well scientifically socially so i never can say it sociologically psychologically politically spatially and in terms of how we could imagine and design a future possibly Takwasi dyson describes herself as a painter working across multiple mediums to explore the continuity between ecology infrastructure and architecture um, Dyson mainly works in abstract, uh, but her works are visual, visually and material, uh, more systems used to construct fusions of surface tension, movement, scale, real and finite space. Liquidity, water and bodies have been a theme lately. Maybe Tukwasi, you will speak about that. Black histories and the passages through water and off water, the extraction of oil from the earth and climate consequences. We've been very much involved in architecture also lately, and also very much in something which I find is a very interesting project dealing with a form of education which goes far beyond uh, classical models of education, the Winterveld's drawing school for environmental liberation which is a roving school, an experiment in co-creating an evolving curriculum, employing techniques used from the visual arts as well as theories of geography, infrastructure and architecture to initiate dialogue about speciality in an era of global crisis due to human induced climate change. Uh, Torquoise's work has been widely shown as well in the US and in Europe, Professor Luis Fresco is an acclaimed scientist known for her work on globally sustainable food production. And she's a writer, novelist, and actively supports infrastructure of culture as well. She has been the president of the Wageningen University and research executive reports since 2014. To mention all the academic positions, board memberships and activities would fill more than the time we have for this recording. It's worldwide and it's academic on a very high level and it's very much involved in everything that deals with the future of food production and our well-being with that. She's also a columnist at NRC Handelsblatt and has published 12 non-scientific books, including three novels. Louise does not shy away from also bold statements, bringing to the forefront our emotional, social, and cultural negative biases around topics such as big agriculture and the monsters of genetic modification. We need to think dispassionately, she says, about the comparative advantages between small scale and large scale. With regards to the negative view towards big agriculture, she states that we cannot think that small scale production is the solution to the world food problem. Over the years, I learned that food is not just about calories and not just about production. It's also about culture. It's about the enjoyment of food. But very much, it's also in today's globalized world, 
about the intricacies of food chains, of how production at one side of the world is linked to what comes on your plate. I believe firmly that if you know more about food and agriculture, you will enjoy it more and also you will make better choices. Because it is difficult to know what is good today. Is good vegetarian? Is good biological or organic food? Is good something that is local? Or is the picture more complicated? And you will see there is not one single choice. What is important to me is that you really understand how the food chain operates and how the food lands on your plate and what choices are involved. I think that food is the thing that's so important that it should really be featuring far more clearly in our education. We learn about history, but we don't learn in schools about the history of our food. I give over to Tokwa Sidaisa now and thank you very much for participating in this. Thank you for having me. I'd begin with what I've been dealing with for a few years now, this idea of black compositional thought. So what I'm sharing with you are ideas and notes that I'm gathering around um, this theory that I'm constructing as a part of my practice. Black compositional thought, note one. I take things apart because I've been taken apart. Deconstruction, a self-portrait, reconstruction and innovation. Two, my approach to painting and sculpture is what I call discursive abstraction. I focus on ideas of systems, liquidity and water as guiding principles for becoming. Three, thinking through geography, cartography and architecture, I use shape, line, plane, mark and space as materials to investigate global systems and plantational scene environments that have molded my Black experience. Notes on Black compositional thought, thought two. What kind of expansion can a painting hold? Can it bring into our senses how encounters become scale and refusals become textured? Becoming and being Black is a movement, a state change, an evolution, a quanta, a distance. Three. Black distance is a form indelibly tied to liquidity. We know who we are as a discontinuous, a discontinuous expansion of blue black. Question, what are the spatial dependencies of a curvilinear liberation? How does distance influence compositions made from oceans rising? Four. The cantilever of Black sensoria is a whole ethos. I mark a line, an edge, an all. Freedom is composing a painting with precarity that keeps Blackness close over, across, and under the edge of being. Note three, two of the most pressing issues of our time are racial capitalism and human-induced climate change and their indelible tie to the relationship to modernism and industrialized white supremacy. What if art and architecture composed from quotidian histories, autonomous indigenous structures and black world building? And how do new encounters with scale, distance, water and involve evolving ecosystems shape infrastructures where liberation systems live on? In closing, on distance, I am certain that the beauty in Black determinacy, from sound to science, from architecture to migration, will continue to guide our solutions to climate and form. Forms that are deeply spatial, generous, and haunting, as they should be. It is this moment of environmental precarity. We will need both liquid and mountains, both bird and lava. And in the density of Black grace, it will always take us to moments of liberation and, our, and beyond our own humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Turquoise. You give me a lot of things to think about. And I think that's exactly why I like so much to interact with scientists and or rather that scientists and artists interact. You know, very often um, art and science have been 
uh, opposed. There's one being about emotion and the other about rationality. And I think actually for me now, after so many years of, of these interactions, I feel we are both expressions of a, a deep human desire to explore the world in different ways and explore our identities. And science has its rules, its rhythms, its regulations, but art has that too. And I think it's, it's fascinating to see how we can come together in that desire to understand the world, the world to explore it um, and encounter also in my feeling similar issues. One of the issues I'm very interested in and I see that a lot in art and I think I see some of that in the little I know about your work and that is the, the, the concept of serendipity, of chance coincidences, of things that you come across that uh, you didn't know before or even what we sometimes in science call masterful failures, things that you um, think are wrong or a mistake and suddenly they turn out to be the best possible thing you can imagine. And I think that exploring of the dimensions of our human mind um, and challenging really ourselves, where do we go? Who are we? Uh, I'm, I'm always so um, very much impressed because I studied a lot of evolutionary biology that we are just this tiny, tiny blue planet in this huge universe of billions and billions of galaxies and stars. And, and we're just there and we've been there for so short in a way. And yet we're so dominant now suddenly on this planet, this little blue planet. And that to me carries also a huge responsibility for not just for this planet, but also to make sure that we understand um, how fragile we are as individuals, how fragile the world is, and also how difficult it is for us to come together. And I think that getting inspiration from the encounter of science and, and art is going to be really important for the future. It's not about just economic calculations. It's not just about politics. All that matters perhaps later on. But the way forward to imagine a world which brings us further, which we cannot imagine, we couldn't even imagine 30 years ago that we would be sitting like this, talking to one another on the internet. It wasn't there 30 years ago. We cannot even look into the future. Only if we combine the creativity of art and science and try to scratch that surface very, very carefully. And so your talk about connectivity, I think is, is crucial for us not to dictate the future, but to sort of see in a kind of fog where we might be heading and how the past brings us a new future. And I think that's that's really what inspiration is about. Does that ring a bell with you at all? I think absolutely. I, I think when you talk about encounters, <clears throat> and this can be a lived experience, living your life in these sort of amazing quotidian ways, and you encounter a, a history that was unknown, right? So there's a sort of register of the unknown in relationship to our past, future and global presence. And I think when those encounters happen, I think um, improvisation you know, is really at its best because as you um, I think spoke so eloquently about chance, like in these chance encounters, you really get to sort of exhaust the possibility of an improvisational moment because those improvisational moments are thick with technique, right? And those techniques come from ancestorship, they come from indigeneity, they come from science, they come from engineering, they come from you know, the ways in which we think mathematically even as, as an abstraction. So this sort of, um, abstraction as a discursive for a painter um, anyway, I think is a real critical moment of, you know, how do we make a painting today and how do we make drawings today? But I think it's critically about, um, you know, encounter improvisation technique and um, a deep interdisciplinary knowledge and respect for each other. So, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what I also find so very interesting in what you said and, and do is the emphasis on liquidity and on water, 
because for me, as a biologist, as a scientist, there is no life without water. I mean, very, very literally. So there is nothing that we can imagine that does not use water in some way or another. And, and for a large part of our existence as a planet, not as, as mankind, our, um, you know, water was the factor that determines everything. And today, um, I live in a country where we feel we have mastered the sea level rise and we've mastered water, but yet at the same time, we have not, of course. And, and as, a, as a global community, thinking about what water has meant, as you say so clearly also in black history and what it will mean for the future, how we can build bridges ab across literal water, but also across the water that sometimes separates people. Sometimes you can be sitting next to someone and yet there is a stream of water in a way, a wild river of misunderstanding between two people and, and trying to cross water in its metaphorical as well as the literal sense and using ingenuity of ideas as well as air engineering and architecture, I think is, is a wonderful way to express how we stand in this world. Oh, I, I agree. I, I think what centers um, my curiosity around water is relationship to the way we've thought about time um, historically and our knowledge around time. And I'm really trying to shift um, from thinking about time and art, um, so both as a metaphor and a, and a material and really place emphasis on distance. And I think the idea of distance as a new sort of theoretical pathway for me exists because how waters, oceans, rivers, metals make us now, right? So, and I think that we understand water as a planetary condition over time, yes, but, but I think mainly over distance because of globalization, because of abstraction, I think that this idea of time and movement and liquidity, we wear on our bodies, uh, I think most expressively. So it really informs uh, yeah. the way the body gets poured into paintings and drawings. But you know, what's interesting. I spent a lot of my time um, when I was younger working in Africa and particularly in Central Africa. And there, of course, you have one of the, the big rivers in the world, the, the Congo River. Um, I also spent time on the Amazon, but that's for another uh, meeting perhaps. But what I thought was one of the most amazing things that happened to me on that river, this is a huge river, very wild river. There are different groups of people, different tribal groups also living along that river. And there's actually quite a, a few traffic because the river is so dangerous. And one day I was walking with a, a group of people. We were trying to find um, sort of new um, soil types and so on. And um, we came to a village and um, these people said, how can you be here? We haven't seen you come up the river. Although these people had never been out of their village, they just knew what happened. And the river for them was a measure of time, a measure of distance, as you say, a measure also of new and old. And mm -hmm. they knew exactly what happened on the river, although they were too afraid to really go downstream themselves very much. But the river was there, it was part of their lives, not just again, not just because they were fishing, but because it was part of their stories. And I spent quite a few evenings listening to the stories about the gods of the river, about mm -hmm. traditions around the river, about mm -hmm. the issue of purity, water and purity are always very much linked. Oh, I wonder whether that resonates with you, with your understanding of water as well. Well, in short, I think that, yes, <laughs> Water is a language of my body absolutely every minute of the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's very interesting that we're, we're re-evaluating water, I think, today. Um, only Also its force, but also um, its life-giving capacity. There's no future without water on this planet. Uh, and that is something we really, really need to understand. And every school kid needs to know this. <laughs> capitalism, egregious extraction, the ways in which um, dispossession continuously happens. I think that it'll always change. I think that registers of resistance, registers of liberation, techniques of deconstruction, 
techniques of um, uh, you know receding and proceeding with different measures of power will, will always shift. E. Soyini Madison talks about a dangerous beauty. I'm ready for a level of beauty that pushes against oppressive systems continuously. I'm ready for a level of beauty and intention that really disassembles systems of power that you know continuously exploit. So I, I can't think of in the condition of the not changing, but in the sense of um, change, I'm ready to exercise a level of beauty that makes vulnerable and precarious somebody else and takes some um, precarity uh, to really another, a, a different level. What you mean is if consciousness um, does not evolve enough to really make us see the, um, the risks of our situation, the challenges and so on. But on that front, I'm actually reasonably um, optimism, although optimism is also a coping strategy. I think we are adjusting certain things and it may be too slow, but on the other hand, if I look back in time in the 10,000 years that we learned to do something like agriculture, how much has changed? I mean, of course we made mistakes and um, we have to adjust to those mistakes, but we're doing so much better than we did, I mean, 200 years ago, more than half of, no, 100 years ago, half of the world population was still hungry. Today, that's only, um, only, um, it's about 12%. And those are people who live in war zones mainly. Now I'm not saying that volume of food is, is a, a criterion, but I think we are learning. And the question is, do we learn fast enough? And how can we promote this awareness? And there, I think, a dialogue between art and science uh, and, and opening people's minds for new opportunities. The world will look quite different in a hundred years times from what we think it is now. And that openness is necessary for us to make change. Thank you very much, Tokwase and Louise. I uh, like very much that there is no condition of no change. And uh, that very much refers also to uh, the, the liquidity, Tokwase started the, the dialogue you had with, together with one another. I think uh, there's a lot uh, to, to, yeah, to learn from that, from that liquidity, and also from the beauty you mentioned, Tokwazi, because I do think that uh, the best that can happen is that uh, we are actually continuously reminded that, um, yeah, that things, are not only the surface, but the surface can help us to move further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tukwasi. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure.